Foundation and especially African Development Plan with Sister Cecile Johnson for doing this work today. We'd like to thank you for taking your time to come out today and to listen to the condition of our people and to get more information about, you know, what it is, where we're at and what it is we need to do to make some sustainable changes to our community. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the founder and president of African Development Plan, Ms. Cecile Johnson. Please give her a round of applause. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming out in this weather. And um, this uh, presentation is going to be filmed. So we will be able to put it up on Facebook and get it out, OK? But today, we're going to talk a little bit about a crisis in black America. And um, what I have done is um, the current state of black people in America and a case study on Illinois. This is a data project that I've worked on for the last two, three years. It's a project that was actually presented um, in Iran last year when I went to a human rights conference. And they were dealing with police brutality in black America. And so globally, we presented to the world to let them know what's happening to us. Um, I have never met more talented people, um, bright minds, than I have here in Chicago. And what we need is for them to be engaged actively in our community. Okay? So this project is a data project with African Development Plan. And I partner, I'm a board member of the National Black Agenda Consortium. I'm also a member of the All People Foundation. And Paula Green, who just spoke, is a co-founder, right? And we will be launching a solution to this, which is called the Power Center. So everything you see me do, because I believe in the National Black Agenda, right? This work is about that. So in America today, the question still is, if you look at the picture, is his life worth less than mine? And is his life worth more than mine? And we know this because when we see every day, we have all these shootings and all these things that are happening. And one would wonder, you know, if, if we're animals, you know, you shoot a man and he's lying in the street for four hours, right? You don't even let the dog stay out there that long. So we want to know um, what's going on. So Andrew Hacker, about 30 years ago, uh, wrote this book, Two Nations, Black and White, Separate, Hostile, and Unequal. He said, black Americans are Americans, yet they still subsist as aliens in the only land they had known. Blacks must endure a segregation that is far from freely chosen, so America may be seen as two separate nations. Of course, there are places where the races mingle. And sometimes we take that to mean that we have arrived, right? Yet, in respects, the separation is pervasive, it's penetrating. As a social and, and human division, it surpasses all others, even gender, in intensity and subordination. Whites who embrace America as a nation fail to feel in any way responsible for its condition. They deem themselves to be above oppressing or holding down their fellow black citizens. On the contrary, they believe that blacks have oftentimes been given unfair advantage. And we see a lot of that. So sometimes when you see elections come up, they'll use a black face to send some negative message. In reality, whites get much more. It's called white privilege. They get so many privileges. And there's a gentleman called Tim Wise who actually uses um, that medium to show them that, you know, you're, you're all on the wrong track when you think other people are getting everything. It's you who have gotten everything. So this deep-seated and often unconscious racism is deeply embedded in the psyche of America, which are reflected in beliefs of superiority and inferiority today. So my question to you is, why do we still have to teach our children a different code, right, to deal with peace officers, right? Look what this little man says. No, son, this isn't the birds and the bees talk. This is about you coming home alive. When you know you're just a child, to some people, you're an adult, an adult who is dangerous and guilty of something. That young man who was shot, Tamir Rice, when we look at him, we see a child, right? What is it about a people that when they look at us, even if it's the baby in the, in the womb, right, they see something, you know, threatening? So don't, put all your, don't, don't pull out your phone to call us, even if he yells at you or pulls out his gun and you get scared, right? Don't run. Just put your hands up in the air. No, it isn't right, but we want you to come home alive. This is a conversation that happens every day in our homes. I had to teach my sons how to, if police stop them, how to deal with them. In the white community, they don't need to do that. So we must deal with the issue of race. And the first step in any form of action is awareness. 
And this is Melody Hobson, who is here, aerial president um, in Chicago. And she says, I work in the investment field. And we have a saying, the numbers don't lie. So today what I'm going to be showing you is that the numbers clearly show we have significant disparities in household wealth, income, job opportunity on every front. So the question is, what happens to a community where on every front you have uh, disparities, right? The one drop rule still persists. There was a recent study by Harvard professors and their work reflects the cultural entrenchment of Americans traditional racial hierarchy, which assigns the highest status to people who are white next to Asians. Latino, and then black. And that's kind of ironic, considering black people build this country, right? Now, when you look across the country, we have more black faces today in high places, but that has not really translated to anything better for us, OK? Today, we have more black elected officials in the United States than at any other point. Now, representation is not what it should be, considering we're 15% of the population. But we have more, yet these black faces have largely governed in the same way as their white counterparts, reflecting all of the racism, all of the corruption, and policies favoring the wealthy seen throughout the mainstream politics. So let's look at data. Black people are 15% of the population in the state, and in Chicago we are 33%, right? Yes. Now we're 33% of the population, so shouldn't we be controlling 33% of, of what's going on? I want you to think about that. Now, between 2000 and 2010, we lost 177,401 black people in Chicago, right? I need you to think about that, too. Where did they go? So, in the world today, there, um, when we look at human development, in the past, we used to look at the economy of a country, and we would say, well, that's how the people were doing. But there's a new standard, it's an international standard, that says, well, how are the people doing? Because that's actually a more accurate picture, right? Today, we have more millionaires and billionaires than we've ever had. Uh, allegedly, that the unemployment rate is low. But when we look at the black community, we don't see that. So we really need to ask, how are the people? So human development is, a what is about what people can do and be. It's a process of improving people's lives, their well-being, and expanding their freedom and opportunities. And we do this with three core areas. One, a long and healthy life. Two, access to knowledge, which is education. And three, we look at a decent standard of living. Because if you don't have a decent standard of living, if you don't have access to knowledge that you can improve yourself, and if you're not living long, then there's a problem with your human development, right? So in the US, the Human Development Index is 5.03. But when you look at what the number is based on race, you see that whites are 5.43, Asian Americans are 7.21, and African Americans and Native Americans are at the bottom. African Americans are at 3.81. So let's look at a long and healthy life, life expectancy at birth. What you're going to see is this. Uh, in 2007 to 2012, life expectancy actually went down for black men and black women. It actually went down for whites too, but not as significant, right? So the state of our health in a so-called industrialized country that spends 17% of its GDP on health is not that great. But what's the significance for us? So you have white men live 74.79 years, black men live 67.66 years. So that's a difference of 7.13 years. That's a big gap. You're paying Social Security and all of that, and you're dropping dead before you can collect, yeah. right? When you have white women live to 78.79 years, black women live to 73.59 years, and that's a difference of 5.2 years. But when you come to Chicago and to Illinois, the gap is actually wider. So here we had Chicago for women, the gap is over six years. And when it comes to men, it's over eight years, right? But it gets worse because where you live impacts how you live, how long you live. And in Chicago, depending on if you live in a zip code where the income is over $53,000 a year or you live in, a, in an area where the income is below $25,000 a year, that's a 14-year difference in your life expectancy, okay? When I came to Chicago, I met so many people, and, and they were, you know, and their, their, their parents had died in their 50s. That's very unusual for my family, because my grandfather lived to 103, right? Grandma up there in the 90s. So, so we, we have something happening, and we're not paying attention to it. So segregation still exists in Chicago, and it's a huge impact for black people. Chicago has remained one of the most segregated cities in the United States, okay? 
And this segregation points to issues of persistent poverty in certain census tracts. And they're very aware of this, right? So they find that nearly all the neighborhoods with the lowest access to chain supermarkets or large independent grocery stores with at least five cash registers are located in the city south side, right? South of Interstate 55 in the city, in an area almost exclusively populated by minorities. That'd be us, right? And because of this, you have lowest educational attainment and lowest access to food. And this means that the people who have shorter life expectancies and poor health tend to be the people in these areas. So those would be us. So that explains why in Illinois you have such a wide gap between white and black life expectancy rates. So in the state of Illinois, 14.7% 4, of the people are in poverty. But when you take that data and you break it down by race, you see that white poverty is like 9.5%, is, is like, um, right? Latinos are 20.7%, and blacks are 31.6%. So it's safe to say that the face of poverty in the state of Illinois are us, right? That's, that's, that's important. This, this presentation is an informational, because we are we're not telling our story properly. And we told our story properly, then maybe we would be able to galvanize and have a collective vision, right? As well as make the people who we elect do more to, to do what they're supposed to do for us. So let's look at North Lawndale, 45.3% poverty. East Garfield Park, 45.4. Burnside, 47.5. Riverdale, 58.3. That means 58.3% of the people living in that community are poor. When you go over 40%, it's called abject poverty, right? So segregation persists in Chicago, and 48 of the 77 communities are predominantly minority. Hence, you have all that gerrymandering where you'll go to a place like Inglewood and find five aldermen, right? It's strategic, folks, right? It's strategic. Now let's talk about mater um, Millennium Development Goals. In the year uh, 2000, 189 countries came together at the UN and they said, we have to do something to reduce poverty, right? And so they said, we're gonna form a, a, a goal, a Millennium Development Goal. And the Millennium Development Goal was one, address poverty, two, address education, three, address um, gender inequity, four, address infant mortality, five, maternal mortality, six, HIV, AIDS, and malaria, Seven was environmental issues, and the eighth goal was that these developed countries of the world were supposed to spend 0.07%. That's all of their GDP to accomplish the goal, right? So when we're looking at black America, it would make sense that we begin to look at these international standards for ourselves. So um, when it comes to infant mortality, we find that in Illinois, again, allegedly where we have equal access to everything, right? 5.4 white children die per thousand live birth, and 14 black children die per thousand live birth, right? And when it comes to maternal mortality, the U.S. is actually on the rise, right? We rank 50th in the world. Can you imagine? We're 50th in the world. And so black women die 3.2 times more than white women in the U.S., okay? Again, all things being equal, why is that, right? But it's worse than that, okay? In America, inequality begins in the womb. Huge disparities in infant mortality and maternal to ma mortality mean that there's a kind of inhuman deprivation that exists in the dysfunction, low-income, crime-ridden environment that is colloquially called a slum, in which the federal government refers euphemistically as a targeted census tract. So it's not like they don't know what's going on. The data tells them, right? The data tells them what's going on. And, and, and what's going on in our communities, there's a whole lot of stress, there's anxiety, there's abuse, there's poor nutrition, there's infrequent doctor visits or no visit at all until the time of delivery because of lack of money and lack of health insurance. Now the president tried to address some of that with the Affordable Care Act, but it hasn't fully addressed it, right? We have inadequate micronutrients, insufficient vitamin B, or infections lead to all sorts of complications and sub subabdominal outcomes, including birth defects, stillbirths, preterms. In our community, this is the only place in the world where you're poor and you're fat. You don't think that's a problem, right? And so a lot of those women end up with hypertension, heart disease. Some of them even have stroke, right? And they're giving birth to the baby. So, so even though 
I've never seen a country where poor people are fat. Normally, you're MAGA, right? You're skinny, right? Now, in Chicago, in 2000 to 2004, data is sometimes, um, like Sister Ya explained yesterday at the Health Forum, um, is sometimes we're behind on the data because they have to do all kind of analysis of it. So in the last period that they looked at, 2000 to 2004 in Chicago, what they found was, remember I told you, one white woman died to three black women, right? That's national. But in Chicago, it's one white woman, one Asian woman, about eight Latinos, and 27 black women. Yes. So it's a 1 to 27 mm. ratio. Mm. Okay? So I'm sure everybody knows somebody who went to give birth, which is the most natural thing, and did not make it. Okay? So during the same time period, African Americans accounted for nearly 75% of the maternal deaths. And yet we are only third of all births. So what are the top 10 causes of death for black America? We can see from 1980, it started off with heart disease and cancer, stroke. Those are still up there. In 2007, we see number four, diabetes, right? And when we look down to number eight, we see kidney disease, and we see HIV. These are all fairly modern things. We are eating ourselves to death. It's poor nutrition that's doing some of this, along with HIV, which is, um, Sister Yaw gave a presentation on that yesterday, right? So when you look at the overall U.S. numbers versus black specific, you see we disproportionately suffer from some illnesses. And why is that? Because in most of our communities, we have food deserts, right? You go into these stores, and you don't see no real food. Chips. I see children eating chips and hot flames and blue juice in the morning, right? So what do you think is going to happen to them? That's not real food. Right? Food is something you eat which regenerates the body, provides vitamins and enzymes to make the body strong. A filler is something you eat when you do, which does not regenerate the body. So sometimes when you see people and they're huge, it's because they're eating because their body is saying we need nutrition. Right? But because they're eating fillers, it ain't going to happen. Now, let's look at the picture. That second guy, the brown guy, you see the hamburger standing all by itself? Right? And then you see the fruit? That's us. It's easy for me to get a hamburger, some fried chicken, some gyros or something, than it is for me to get fresh fruit. And fresh fruit is live. You need live food to eat. But if you go to the Latino community, where they are equally, um, they're not doing as well as, uh, as, as others, but when it comes to food, they got that under control, right? So the question then is, why have we allowed this to happen? When I went to Iran, we insisted that they take us to the poor neighborhoods. And in the poor neighborhoods, I made, I made them stop so I could go into the stores. They had these little stores. Do you see what's in the store there? Right? Real food. Eggs. Juice. Oil. When you go into our stores, what do you see? Chips. Pork rinds. Flaming hots. Soda. Old food that has expired. Right? So not only do you pay more, but you pay more for junk. Okay? And right next door, I went into, uh, uh, I saw a fruit stand. I said, stop, right? Look at the fruit stand. How hard is it to put up a fruit stand like that, folks? They say no rocket science, and this is not even a high amount of, uh, of revenue to, to generate, right? So this was, a, this was a store. All he had was the boxes of fruits. And guess what? 12 o'clock at night, they were still open. Okay? 12 o'clock at night, it was still open. So my question to you is, why can't we have small stores like this in the community? This is not high, expensive, resource-driven solutions. This would be just like a will, right? A will to survive. So the patient-to-doctor ratios in 12 Chicago neighborhoods equal to third world countries. I don't like the word third world because I'm from Jamaica and I'm no third world person, right? Baba Anderson Thompson from the Center for Inner City Studies teaches us that, that, that we are the first world because the first world had to do with civilization and we the cradle of civilization, okay? However, this was the frame that they put it in in the newspaper, right? So you have Aus Ashburn, Auburn Gresham, Austin, right? And, and these are communities mostly in the city south and southwest side that there are more than 3,000 people to a doctor. Again, we spend 17% of our GDP on health, but obviously not in the black community, right? And when it comes to asthma and lead, South Side children have the greatest exposure to Chicago, in, to lead in Chicago. And Inglewood is like the number one, right? So that's why you're seeing um, the asthma and all these things. 
So Flint, hey, it's not just Flint. It's, it's all over. Yes. Okay? And they have not been very honest even with our water. Now, ironically, when it comes to suicide, black people have the lowest suicide rate. Now, that's kind of contradictory because every time you look, you hear about somebody else getting shot, right? So inquiring minds need to ask, hmm, who's shooting all these people? Because the data say that when it comes to suicide, we're the lowest, right? So there's something missing there. And this is a good thing. Violence and crime should be a public health issue, right? Because we know that in Chicago, when we look at those who are attacked, 68.8% of them are black. And when we look at who are the victims, 78.1% of them are black. Okay? So guess what? This is a black issue, and black people need to be coming up with the solutions for it. We have a new commissioner that they're looking for for the police. Uh, if anybody should be making that decision, it should be us, right? So I'm just saying to you, when you look at the data, the data is telling you these are our affairs, right? And yeah, he may be the mayor or whatever, but it's our affairs, okay? So our communities are like war zone. In 2014, Inglewood was the deadliest hood, right? They had like 49 people die and 300 and something people shot. Come on, people. We all know who, who's doing some of this, right? And what about the psychological violence? Because we have to begin to reframe the question of what is violence. Violence is not just me bop you upside your head or kill you. Violence is policies that are put into place that create conditions that then show some of this. And we all know that from we came here, right? Now, first, some of our ancestors were here because we are indigenous people, right? So don't let nobody fool you, right? And then some of our ancestors were also brought here as enslaved people. So this be our country, right? So now, from that moment, from that time till now, whether they came in and wiped you out with the diseases or they brought you here and then wiped you, you know, worked you to death, we've been under psychological trauma, like a terrorist, domestic terrorism, right? Yes. So where, where, what, what happens to you when you live in a community where your life is in jeopardy on a daily basis? I can't send even the baby outside, right? So... You have to struggle to survive. Your dignity and humanity is assaulted. I mean, these young people, every time I pass and somebody got them on the ground, right, feeling them up, that's sexual abuse, right? And doing all them touching and feeling. I spoke to a young woman who the, the, the woman cop put her hand down in her, in her chest. She still felt violated, right? We're not dealing with all of this. These are, these are inhumane. It's not right. You're treated like a third-rate citizen in a seemingly first-rate. That's what the U.S. would like the world to believe, right? They like to talk about human rights and other people, but we need to talk about our human rights. So who is protecting our human rights? Each of us has a story of police harassment, brutality, driving while black, overuse of force when arresting, false arrests, right? Voter denial, they purge in the, the, and scrub in the list, right? Jim Crow laws, lynching still occurs, right? in so many different ways, medical experimentation, convict leasing. The 13th Amendment says slavery was abolished, except you're incarcerated, right? So wake up, except you're incarcerated, means that once you go to jail, you are a slave. Okay, so slavery ain't abolished. Is that a new Jim Crow, right? Well, it's employment for them because when they, when they, when they can't find a job to give you when you're out, but as soon as you get locked up, we certainly find some jobs for you. Right? And now they want to sue you to pay back the money that they charge to take care of you after they don't rented you out anyway. So I'm just saying to you, we need to become cognizant. And so when we're looking at what solutions need to be, we need to address these things. So how are the people doing? Let's talk about human development indicator number two, access to knowledge, educational degree, and school enrollment. Right? In today's, today's public schools, success for African Americans is too often elusive. It's even more elusive now than it was 10, 20 years ago, right? Why? Our society still bears the legacy of a long history of racism, exclusive and low expectations for African-American children, and our public education system has not adequately responded to remedy the situation. This is a persistent challenge. And this challenge not only impacts us, but it impacts America. We have to learn to begin to, when we're giving this conversation, we have to show them how it benefits them too, right? That's how you're going to win some of this. 
So let's look at fourth grade achievement. In, in 2013, 18% of our children were on level, meeting expectancy at, at, at fourth grade level, 18%, right? That means 82% did not. When it comes to reading, again, so that was math, 18%, 2013, right? Now, you can't move up the grades if you can't read. So let's go to eighth grade. Eighth grade math, 14% of them are on level. Well, are we surprised that if they can't read at fourth grade and the work gets harder every year, and when they get to eighth grade, right, there's a difference. Most of the math, you have to be able to read the problems, right? It's not just numbers. So 17% of the students, black students, are on target or on proficient in reading at the eighth grade level. So folks, this explains why in our community you'll see when there's an eighth grade, you see how they all have this massive graduation celebration. Well, most people never make it to high school, OK? Oh, no. So they spend the resources celebrating an eighth grade graduation. And who can do anything with an eighth grade graduation? Right. No. Can't do a darn thing with it, OK? So, so we, we have reacted and responded, but it's, it's inappropriate. So now we have children going to high school, and when they get to high school, if you have 17% of them are reading proficient, you now present them with books that have higher level learning, right? How are they supposed to read it? So what we need in our community is an intervention. Use the data to do something. That's where the churches come involved. That's where the community yeah. gets involved. That's where the yeah. volunteerism yeah. gets involved, right? Because guess what? We need to learn to read. Uh -huh. They are afraid of us knowing how to read. That's why the data is so low. Because right. this ain't nobody trying to make us read, right? I would cancel all the other subjects and focus on reading and writing right. and math, okay? So in the state of Illinois, you have one of the widest gap, student achievement gap between white and black. It's like 33 percentage points. And that's for the fourth grade reading. And when it comes to eighth grade, same thing, 34 percentage point difference. That's 34 percentage points between a white child's achievement and a black child's achievement. And then you wonder why when they leave, if they finally do make it, they can't move much further. So race does matter. Black and Latino students are more educationally segregated now. Imagine we had Brown versus Board of Education from 1954, right? And all the system did was find ways to circumvent desegregation, right? And, and, and us looking at it as an activist, we say, hey, we tried your system with the, no. with the integration. And look at the results, right? We have students coming out of those eras, 60s and 70s, who have gone on to be some of our most outstanding citizens. So all of this mixing up has not done very much for us. We also have unequal school resources. And the wealthiest 10% of US schools spend nearly 10 times more because sometimes the students, the resources that are coming in are tied to property tax. And if your community has been redlined and traditionally you know, being poor uh, uh, and, and housing costs is low as far as what your property asset is worth. And a lot of renters. A lot of renters, they don't have the same commitment, right? So, so it trickles down. And, and this trickled down to the government in the 30s and 40s, um, creating, the government created those, those barriers to who could get mortgages, right? right? So it wasn't just individual bankers who came up with this. The government had regulations and the bankers complied conveniently. Right. So once students fall behind, it's difficult to catch up. We find that in the state of Illinois, only 29% of children who are four years old attend a preschool, right? That's a problem. I started preschool at three years old. We're looking at how do we get them in school, especially if they're coming from homes where their parents themselves were not educated from the two years old. We need an intervention. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So when you're thinking solutions, look at our reality. A lot of our moms don't have, we're not raised, right? We're still feeling ramifications of the crack epidemic of the 1980s. Right. Okay? Two generations, because 15 years old, people having children. Now we find grandma is 30 years old, right? Oh, yeah. So let's just be real. Again, let's talk about us. When you talk about us, then we have to have solutions. So our babies, which are these young moms, need some mothering, right? So maybe we need to be intervening from the pregnant, right? Okay. 
So we look here and we saw that in 2012 in Chicago, 12% of the fourth graders were proficient. So we talked about that. So before when I gave you national numbers, I'm showing you that on a local level, the trend is the same, right? And poverty matters across all racial groups. As you can see, again, we talk about the areas in Chicago where some of the children are coming from. When you're coming from, you know, I go to schools across the city. And when I go into most of our schools, the children don't have no pencil, right? They have no paper. They spend so much time sharpening a pencil. I have to put out a call and ask can anybody lend the brother a pencil. I have to give them a lecture on, please, could you, you know? But these are realities. If, you're, if your household income is not as great as it is, and you yourself went through a process that you did not feel that you got an education out of this babysitting service that's going on here with CPS, then it ain't important for you to get Johnny to school with some pencils and paper and the book bag, right? But we as community are going to reap the ramifications of that. So we as community need to come on in, right? And begin to address some of this. So Chicago public schools have a third of the state's low income students, right? There's a difference. There's a difference. With the, it's not the children's fault. If you're coming from very object poverty, you're coming from homes where the values about education and all that are just not there, yeah. it ain't going to trickle down into your head. Because when you go home, they're going to tell you how you're acting like you're white. Well, guess what? Our ancestors built pyramids. They had to have tremendous knowledge of math and science. Those pyramids can, are still around and can be seen from space. Okay? So guess what? You have to tell the children that we come from greatness. Right? We come from greatness. Math and science is very important. Right? And they need to be able to get it. So even though we may be poor, we're only poor resource-wise, our genetic pool is very rich. Right? 11% of CPS graduates are college ready. CPS is 45% Latino, 39% black, and 9% white. Who do you think them 11% who are college ready are? Exactly. Okay, so that means it's even lower for us. So when they talk about 69% graduation rate, that's some foolishness. Go talk to some of them children. They can't even write, right? After they get to a certain age, they have to push them up. And they push them up and push them out. And they cut all those programs that they used to be able to. A lot of children, you know, today we still need plumbers, electricians, and carpenters and all that. In fact, those jobs are going to outlast any jobs because we still need to live somewhere. Food, clothes, and shelter, okay? And yet we find that all those things that used to be able to give us the skills that we needed have been cut out of the schools. You think it's not deliberate? And then you have unions that then lock you out, right? So we're going to have some solutions for that. As you can see, high school graduation by race, African Americans are the, loaded, the lowest. Latinos speak Spanish, and some of them don't even speak it well, and they're doing better than us, right? When I'm in schools, there's a di there is a marked difference. When I go into Latino schools, it's a difference. There's a difference in the way the children behave. There's a difference in the resources. A lot of times they have more resources than I see in the black schools. That's our fault. Okay? Go into the schools in your community and look around. Volunteer. Right? Volunteer. Right? See what's going on. You are a community member. You have a right. These are our future these people are playing with. Low performing schools like this one here. This was Robeson. Right? Level two. This has been level two for like intensive support. It's been there like for like 10 years. What kind of foolishness is that? What? That's foolishness. Okay, people? And it's a beautiful school. I'm talking about the surroundings and the potential. The children have challenges. They are in the highest crime. They're also in one of the poorest, right? So what do we need to do? They need wraparound services, right? They need more of us, all these retired elders. Hello, can you get into the schools and talk to some of these children? You'll be surprised. I talk to them just like this. I don't care who you are, right? And they're very receptive because they can tell if you care. They need big mama. They need grandma. All them elders in the senior homes, that's, that's a setup. We don't need no more senior housing. We need intergenerational housing so that the elders can be part of our lives, right? I'm just saying we need to stop accepting what they give us a solution. Because the history says that anything they give us ain't for us. It's a setup. So could you stop accepting it? So 
you need to become familiar with what is happening in schools near you, right? There's something called the Illinois Report Card. You can go into your own schools and the schools in your community and you look it up, right? How are the children performing? Now, there's a tremendous need for minority teachers. Even though black teachers make up less than 30% of the teaching force in Chicago, they were the hardest hit when they lay off. You see all them 50 schools that got closed, right? We were the first out the door, okay? Of the 347 tenured student um, teachers, 51% were African American. That's who, got, who lost their jobs. But it's worse than that. There's been very little growth in black teachers from 1986 to 2011, right? And when it comes to Illinois, you see that the black population in the schools is 17.5% and the teachers are 6.4%, right? All things being equal, we should at least have 17%. But I say this to you, when you look at the fact that we are 39% black, 45% Latino, the majority of the teaching staff should look like us, okay? Latino children need their culture reinforced too, right? If you go to Chinatown, I'm sure you're going to see Chinese teachers in the classroom, okay? So, so that's us. That's on us. Because guess what? If I don't dress my son and send him out to your school in the morning, you won't have no children to collect some money off of, right? So these are bargaining chips. Those first few weeks of school, if I don't send my child, you don't get no money for the rest of the year, right? We have things that we can do strategically, okay? We don't have to keep accepting all of this. So what is needed? We, know we need more black students going into education, health, business, and engineering. It breaks my heart when I see all these students who have a love. I have some of the little children, and they'll say, even the little ones that, you know, wreck my nerves, they'll say, I want to be a teacher, right? I want to be a teacher. But I know that when they finish high school and they end up going to college, those first two years is pure remediation. So not only are they getting into student debt, right? Because they can't handle the work. Because I told you they ain't reading on level, doing math on level. Most of them have 14 ACT scores. The school just let them in because guess what? Ching, ching, we are a cash cop, right? Yeah. right? They make money on us from a jump out of our mother womb till we lie in the coffin, okay? And we need to be aware of this. So we need more young people getting into education. So when you have the program that they have at Chicago State, you'll have all those people getting a degree. And then, and then like 17% of them will pass the test, the state test for teachers. Now how is it you finish the whole course and you can't pass the test? So what does that mean? We need those of you who are good at teaching to begin to tutor them so they can pass the test. Right? This is not rocket science. You have to apply yourself. And since they've gotten the education, they have the cultural sensitivity, they understand because they were in school, right? They actually will make good teachers, but they just need a little bit more. So what can we as a community do to educate them, empower them, get them ready so they can pass that test? In, in the past, you could go to the university and, and, and get a job sweeping the floor. And you used to make a good living. Today, if you don't take a test, you can't get that job. So now you don't have no education, can't take the test to do a job that you don't really need a test for. But they have found a way to systematically lock you out legally, legit. I can say you don't pass the test, right? That's right. It's a, it's, a, it's a setup. But we can beat this setup if we understand it, okay? Now we gotta create our own schools and grow our own teachers. We have to implement an African-centered curriculum. I call it indigenous-centered. Wherever you live, the, the, the instruction you're getting should be about you, right? What's the sense of me learning all of this? And we have students here in Chicago, some of our brightest, and where do they end up going off to school? Harvard and Yale, and we never see them again. So the little community that has so little, right? These people go off to school, and when they get to school, we never see them again. So we don't invest in your upliftment and not in ours, okay? Now, in the 30s to the 60s, there was a renaissance, a women's renaissance here in Chicago. And what they did is they brought in back book, their book clubs. They were reading about their black history, right? Those ladies were then also part of the school, the teachers. So the teachers were reinforcing that. That's when the Cultural Arts Center was created, right? And they began to incorporate those ideas into the culture. So it was being, we were being bombarded with ourselves. We were more black conscious. We need this black consciousness. So that's what an African-centered curriculum is, right? And it's not only about just us here, it's about us globally, as global black people. Because the same problem I had in Jamaica. I left Jamaica, I knew more about European history, I knew more about you and America, right? Because I was a geography and history whiz. 
that I knew about my history. My history was about dates of conquest, similar to your own, right? So it's about perspective model, and whoever is the one giving the story is going to be his story. So where's our story? Our children need to stop feeling inferior, thinking sla uh, slavery is the beginning of our history, right? And you go to Africa, it's the same thing. They think colonialism is the beginning of, of, of their history, right? And, and, and all their traditional everything is some juju. Really? Really now? Okay? So we need to stop. We, we have to stop this. It's a global thing. Okay? And we must include the trades. Because right now, we need some plumbers, electricians, some carpenters, right? We need people who can cook. Right? Mechanics. Everything that we need, we should be paying one of us. So, educate versus incarcerate. Only 5% of college students in 2008 were black men. Right? That's why the community looked like this. Right? At the same time, men were incarcerated more than 6.5 times the rate of white males. And more black women go to college than black men. And then some of the sisters come out and they feel like, oh, the brother got trades so he ain't good enough. Right? That's a problem. Because these are the men in our past who were the backbone of our community, right? And were strong men in our community, the trades. So how are the people doing? A decent standard of living. When it comes to weekly earning, one of the things that I discovered was that Asian men and Asian women are the highest earners. But guess why? Go through our community, who own the stores? The Asians. Asian is Chinese. Vietnamese, Korean, right? Yep. Indian, they all classified under Asian. Yep. They come from Asia. Okay? They have the highest wage earning. And when you look at us, blacks have black women have 79% of, of the income and black men have 67% of an Asian income. Because Asian is the top, right? Remember I told you human development index? They were 7.9. That means they had the best health. They also have the best money, <laughs> right? There's a correlation, okay? So how, what would a black man do with an extra $313 weekly? Three times four is 12. That's 1,200 and 13, 30 is 20, 72, right? That's a lot of money, okay? Same thing for the women. And the greatest disparities happened that the median net worth of black households in 2011 was 6,446, and it was lower than it was in 1984. So we ain't making no progress. I don't care what. When we hear the news, sometimes it annoys me because it ain't about my reality. Okay? It's not my reality. Okay? And while white household net worth was almost 11% higher, higher earning married households on average have less wealth than lower earning white households. Ooh, they don't get that. Okay? Y'all need to get that. Okay? Y'all really need to get that. So where does Illinois stand? Again, I told you that when it comes to poverty, 31.6% of the people who are poor in Illinois are black. So it's a black problem, right? And when it comes to children, 44.6% of African American children were affected by poverty. That's high, folks, 44.6%, right? That's not their fault. That's because we lack economics in our community, right? and that we're not getting the education that can actually rise us up out of it or help us to become entrepreneurial, right? And so the impact we're seeing, jobs and income, right? Nationwide, black unemployment is consistently two and twice that of whites. And this is like going back six decades. So when they keep telling me all this foolishness about how unemployment went up and down, da, 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 no, it's always been a big gap, okay? So black, in 2013 was 17%, white was 7.9. They say in the state of Illinois, I think it's down to five point something. I don't see that when I'm walking around the community, right? And so when you look at the, the, um, the unemployment, one of the things that we noticed was that there were some cities like Chicago Heights, Harvey, Kankakee, North Chicago, and East St. Louis. And when you looked at their unemployment rate, their unemployment rate was high persistently, right? So again, when they tell you that things are happening and you get caught up in the, in, the, in the hype, you miss the fact that these communities were experiencing economic conditions that look like a severe recession even before the recession, right? right? right. So therefore, when they come in to tell you all of this, 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 and then they'll say, oh, well, now we ain't got no money. Well, you, well apparently you never had no money all along, <laughs> right? Because we've been having this great recession in our community for quite a while. 
So we need to begin to be able to look at um, data, right, and connect the dots and decipher it, right? In Chicago, in Illinois, one in two black males, 16 to 24, are unemployed. But in the city of Chicago, in 2013, 92% of black males, 16 to 24, were unemployed, right? Some of y'all like to say the devil find work for idle hands, but brothers are industrious. they looking for some entrepreneurship, right? All we have to do is switch those skills into some other things, okay? But thank God they are entrepreneurial because they got babies and they got children and they have roof and food to eat, right? That's normal. Food, cold, and shelter had to be taken care of. So therefore, let us help them. We're the only community that hasn't provided anything for them, right? Then we wonder why they're doing all of this. If one more elder tell me about these youth, I'm going to, okay. Because I can't take it. They didn't jump out of their mama big, right? And we didn't leave nothing for them. How are we blaming them? Absolutely. And the fact that they are now 18, 19, 20, did you do anything for them from 0 to 18? Right. Okay, so then stop talk, right? If you're going to talk about what you're going to help them to do as we're going to find solutions, then people need to stop talking because right. mm, 83% nationally. So this is, not, this is a trend. This is a trend. It's 92% here in Chicago, but it's 83% nationally. That means if you go to Philadelphia, if you go to New York, if you go to Miami, if you go to Fort Lauderdale, if you go to Atlanta, if you go to L.A., Everywhere we are, go down to Mississippi, it's the same thing. It's the same thing in the Caribbean and in Africa. Same thing. This is a global thing. That's why I say, y'all who don't think you're African, uh, and you're black people in the globe, right? Uh, it's a global condition. When I go to Jamaica, I see the same thing. If I go to Colombia, it's the same thing. Go to Brazil, it's the same thing. I go to Africa and they own the land, it's the same thing. This is a global economic system. So the high unemployment leads to high poverty, which leads to high black on black violence. I know when I ain't got no money, I am a little bit more short tempered, right? right? I don't know about the rest of you. I'm just being real. So therefore, can you imagine day in, day out, that's just your condition? Yeah. This is why the stress is so high, right? Because of stress. And then this has been a long term stressful thing we've been under. So when you look at the, the, on a, the back and back violence, I showed you this before, a person gets shot every 3.19 minutes, right? It's our problem. Let's own it. We have a crisis. Our communities are war zones. The other day when Spike was here doing Chirac, and my, my alderman, crazy alderman, kept talking about, uh, you know, we should not give him any funding. I'm saying Spike at least giving the people some money. He did provide some employment. What did you do lately, right? I live in Chirac, okay? I like to call things what they are, call a spade a spade, because then I can honestly find a solution. So, so let's stop being cute, right? We in Chirac because more people been killed here than got killed in, in Iraq. And in the month of January, one day I was uh, listening to the radio, and it was like the 13th day of the month, and they had already had how much people shot. I was in shock. We have a crisis going on here that y'all ain't paying attention to. Right? People usually get shot in the summertime. Now they're killing a lot of people and it's cold because they have a hit on our community going on right now. All them youth rise up last November, right? They checking some of that. It's always intimidation. So let's stop being cute. I keep telling you, it ain't gonna save us. Weekdays are a shooting spree. Daily three to nine, murder and mayhem. So what that mean? It means that after children leave school, we need some programs for them. If you have a church and your church only open on Wednesday and Sunday to collect collection and you can't do no programs that, that have after school, before school or something, then y'all need to close that door. Because once we organize, we're going to shut you down. All right? We're going to shut you down. You cannot continue to pimp the community. Provide some services. Provide something for the children. Provide some services for the elders. Provide something, but don't just come with your hand out, collect the collection, take it to the white bank, and then what? Right? So, murder and mayhem, 3 to 9 p.m., we know when it happens. Find a way to help it. Who are we protecting? No suspects charged. Who is killing our children? That's why I say some of this is us. Some of it ain't us. Okay? But because we haven't checked the community and we haven't locked down the ones that we do know about, they can kill us and just add it to the list. Because you know them black people are violent, right? But did you notice that the suicide rate was the lowest for us? So how come we not suicidal? Mm. Are we killing all these people? Right. Hmm. These are what you say. Yeah. Things that make you go. Hmm. Okay. 
Connect the dots. It, it's not logical. It's not, it's not making sense. So we got to address the family structures and what the 40 plus year war on drugs. Every time they have a war, it's a war on something, but it's really a war on us. Okay? There's books, there's stories, you can go on the internet. COINTELPRO is real. The Black Panthers came in and they were about uplifting us and they were actually doing it themselves. And that wasn't good enough. Can you imagine you live in a place where you're trying to help yourself and that's not good enough? They put a hit on your leaders, a hit on your structure, and wipe out all of that. And now we see what we got, right? We've been terrorized into submission. But guess what? We're dying anyway, so I suggest you all wake up. Because if I'm going to die, I'm going to die for something. Okay? I'm going to die for something. Okay? So, war on drugs, war on black community created our family structure and economic basis, right? And then when you look at, this is the only place where you look at who is killed by the police. In 2015, 1,140 people were killed across the United States by the police, right? And of that, we had 303 who were black. And of that, 23 were in Illinois. When you look at this year, 117 people, this is up to yesterday, have been shot by the police across the country, right? So we, we you know, I, used to, I draw a picture when I'm in the school sometimes, I say to the young people, I say, I say, on the one side we have the community, and on the other side we have the police, right? And in, in the, no, on one side we have the so-called gangster, right? And on the other side we have the police with his gun drawn. And we the police, we, we, we the community, we the, we the ones in the middle, right? We the ones in jail. We're in jail. Because the people who are supposed to be protecting us, the peace officers and law enforcement, we are afraid of them. Okay, they the gangsters. No, that's the original G. You understand? So, so, so we need to understand that. Okay? Because this is, this is time for us to begin to have our men and women who want to. Mr. Farcon put out a call for 10,000 warriors, right? We should be running our community. We don't need other people to do this. Now let's talk about juvenile um, incarceration. Again, youth make up 14.5% um, of the, the youth, youth are 18.2% in Illinois and 33.7% in Chicago, right? And it costs $78,000 to keep a juvenile in prison. 78,000, right? All they have, you see that monopoly? Every card says go to jail, go directly to jail, do not pass, go, right? A, a gentleman who sits on the Juvenile Justice Commission said to me that they are very clear that they have destroyed our family structures because when they arrest a white child and they call home, they get a body. When they call our homes, they ain't get nobody. So therefore, that whole process now begins to happen, right? And that's why we have 78% of the arrestees as far as juveniles are, are, are black. We have a schoolhouse to jailhouse, 42% of CPS students in 2012 accounted for 75.5% of school-based arrests. Now this is crazy. They are in school and you have police monitoring our children, right? That's, that's failure of the adults in our community to be responsible for their children. There is no place else where people let you do anything you want. And again, they understand that they have broken our family structures and ain't nobody protecting the children. And so they do what they want, okay? You have to stop this. Yes, baby. <laughs> so you look at the juvenile arrests, and you see that 78% of the juvenile arrests are black children, right? And we know that when it comes to drug arrests, it's disproportionate also. And what the data shows is that white children are actually more prone to drugs than anything else. Okay? And what is interesting, I don't know if anybody's paying attention, because the, the, the state don't have no budget, but two weeks ago on the radio, I heard that they were setting into place a program on the west side that dealt with heroin, right? Yeah. That they were now going to not arrest you, but they were going to put the seller and the user into treatment. That's because heroin is kicking butt in the suburbs, okay? So, so even when they don't have no budget, they find money. You understand what I'm saying to you? So stop telling me. If you open your mouth and tell me they don't have no money, blah, 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 I don't want to hear it because it's cost 78000 to incarcerate. So obviously, if we save you from putting that child into the lockup, we saving seventy-eight thousand dollars, right? right yeah. So, how much of that can we then spend on a program that's going to actually do something for these children? So, this breakdown here is 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 just shows you all the police districts. There are twenty-five of them, and what the, what the program shows is, is that in no matter if we are two percent of the population, right, or ninety percent of the population, the majority of arrests are us. 
right? And the reason for that is that even though Chicago is like almost even black, white, and Latino, right? The majority of people who are on the police force are white, right? But if they lock everybody up and everybody have a criminal record, then they can say, oh, we can't find nobody, right? But that's a lie. One of my friends said two years ago, her son screamed past everything and, and, and then never heard from the police. So then this man came to uh, Tavis Smiley's show and he was talking to us, he was a policeman, and what did he say? He said that the woman at the time who was running things made a decision to send out notifications via email. So this probably came to his email box and went into spam, right? So when the city is now telling you, oh, we gotta go do more testing and all of that, how about you go back to the list two years ago, right? And all them people who pass, who took, who, who took their time, I don't know anybody who gonna go through, jump through hoops to pass screening and psychological tests, and how about you start there first, right? So it's a setup. Everything with us is a setup, right? I said to the man, he was a black man at that, I said, brother, wouldn't it make sense you just start there? He looked like he was goofy, right? I said, you're not even logical. You're going to start a whole process again. So that tells me you're insincere. So don't tell me that you're looking for people in our community. Because you darn well know where they are, and you sent them an email and it went into their spam, and you never tried to reach them again. And that should be illegal, because you should have been forced to send a, a letter via the mail, because that's where you say you live. You didn't live in the email box. OK? OK. So. So the event of an arrest is truly life-altering for anyone taken into police custody. We've got to work to prevent youth involvement with police and criminal delinquent court systems. This, despite sensational media reports, most of the 70% of the people who are under 17 and younger were, were arrested. So it's not like, when you turn on the TV, it looks like, my God, every black child is a criminal, right? It's not true, right? We're going to talk a little bit later about that, how this system wraps everything around to give the message it wants to give, right? Because we are on the genocide. So the data presented shows that um, the maps include that juveniles on the south and west side of Chicago are more likely to find themselves in police custody. And we know that contact with law enforcement has a negative image and impact on the young person. But think about it. You're working. Most black people have jobs that are not so secure, right? Probably lower paying. Now your child is arrested. That means you have to take off time from work, right? Then when they send your children to all these juvenile facilities all over the state, now you have to find more resources. Do you understand how the money in our community just drained out, right? Just like a big hole you just keep falling into, right? How are you supposed to lift yourself up where every time you look, we're caught up in this criminal injustice system, right? So community got to find a way, new and creative ways to reach young people before they're arrested or come to the attention. I was in school with a little boy, and he was seven years old, and the whole morning, he was defiant, I mean, really defiant. I was saying to myself, Lord have mercy, right? Then after lunch, mysteriously, he came over to my desk and he started talking to me. So he started telling me about how his daddy was a gangbanger, right? And he said, he said, and, and he was saying, you know, actually, he wasn't saying anything negative about the police. So obviously he wasn't coming from some place where he was poisoned, right? And then he said, he said, but, my, my, but he said, y'all get upset about um, people killing people, but y'all ain't got no jobs for them. This is seven years old, okay? The seven-year-old is analyzing our economic situation, okay?